Thank you so much, David. Always, always a blessing to have you. Thank you. God in heaven, we continue in this spirit of worship, in this spirit of of lifting up our hearts, of opening our hearts, Lord, and seeking to receive your blessing, your message, to be to be uh, overwhelmed with your presence and your spirit, Lord. Uh, we come here seeking a word from you, Lord. Uh, we are here to fellowship. We are here to worship, Lord. Uh, and we are here to know that there is still God on the throne who loves us and is working out his perfect will in our lives and in our world. So God, uh, continue to speak to us now as we spend time in your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Last, uh, last Sabbath, I shared in the connection of our visioning process that God has given all of us a general vision of wanting us to be filled with His Spirit. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus talks about this and, and that we would be uh, witnesses that would go out to the world. So whatever we do uh, as a church or as a Christian individual should be influenced and uh, should be dictated by that reality. We need to have the Holy Spirit in our lives. We need to have uh, the understanding that everything we do uh, should be in the context of sharing the love of Jesus with our fellow man. Today I want to talk about the importance of our name. What's in a name? And uh, before I get to the kids' quiz, and I will be getting to a kids' quiz, so, but before I get to that, though, um, I just want to uh, share a, uh, a biblical reality that you may be aware of or maybe you've never thought of before. When Jesus was on the earth, all the stories that we have in the Gospels make it very clear that when God wanted to do something powerful amongst His people, when Jesus was with Him, He did it through either His Word or His touch, or both, okay? Jesus, when He performed a miracle, when He had a sign, when He had a wonder, virtually every time it was either by His Word, He would declare something, and or by His touch. Most of the time they were together. When he raises the widow of Nain, uh, son, he touches the coffin and then says, young man, I say to you, arise. So by his word and his touch, he is able to, to manifest the power of God. But it doesn't always happen that way. In Matthew chapter 8, when the centurion comes to Jesus and he says, look, my servant is suffering. I, I need you to, to, to heal my servant. Jesus says, yeah, I'll come to you. And, and the, the centurion says, no, I'm not worthy for you to come into my home, but I'm a man of authority. I know that when I speak, I can expect things to happen. And I know that you're also a person in authority that if you just speak it, you can declare it. And Jesus is blown away by this. He says, not even in Israel have I heard such faith. He says, go, it will be according to as you have believed. So without ever entering the home, never touching him or doing anything, just because of his declaration and because of the faith of that centurion, the man is healed. But there are other times when Jesus doesn't even speak and people are healed. The most famous of those is probably the, the woman who had the issue of blood, who was suffering greatly, who said to herself, if I but touch him, I will be healed. And she reached out, didn't even get flesh, right? Didn't even get uh, uh, the body. She just touches the hem of his garment, or, or more technically, the tassel of his garment, and she's healed. Jesus didn't speak a word, but he realizes something that's happened. He stops. He says, what? What? I just felt power go out of me, right? So in the Gospels, when God wants to do something powerful, when God wants to do something miraculous, it is generally by His Word and or by His touch. But when Jesus goes back to heaven and He sends the Holy Spirit to be among His people in Acts chapter 1, you will be filled with His Spirit. You'll be uh, empowered by the Spirit. The way in which the church operates changes. No longer are miracles and the works of God manifested by a declaration of an individual's word, which would make sense because I'm not the Lord. I can't just speak it and it's going to happen, right? Nor is it necessarily by touch. When you go through the book of Acts, virtually every miracle and work of power is done through a look and by declaring or invoking the name of Jesus. It changes. The demons are driven out when Paul looks at them and then invokes the name of Jesus. Peter at the gate called beautiful. He looks at the beggar and then says, in the name of Jesus, I say to you, Jesus Nazarene, uh, arise. 
So they, the invocation, the realization that the name of Jesus has power among His people becomes the motivating realization of the church in Acts. And that becomes the model for us today to understand that if we are going to have power, if we're going to finish the work of the book of Acts, we need to understand this dynamic as well. And so I'm not going to put every one of these verses on the screen, but just notice how in the book of Acts, how often in all the context that the name of Jesus is mentioned. We know this from uh, the, the day of Pentecost. Repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and you will receive, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's not optional, friends. The Holy Spirit is not something that we say, I'd like to have it today. Tomorrow, I'm not so sure about. Maybe when I get super holy, maybe when I'm perfect in the Holy Spirit. That's not how it works. If you love Jesus and you've invited him into your life, he has given you the Holy Spirit and wants you to understand that he he is a reality in your life. But Peter said, this is in another part, Acts chapter 3, the the, uh, man to the gate called beautiful. I do not possess silver and gold, but what I do have you, I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, walk. We'll come back to that one a little bit later. And on the basis of faith in his name, it is the name of Jesus which has strengthened this man. And the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect health in the presence of you all. It's it's the recognition of the name. In Acts chapter 4, you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant Jesus. Acts chapter 8, but when they believed Philip preaching, uh, Philip's preaching the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized. When they believed the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, men and women alike. Barnabas and Paul took hold, oh, excuse me, Acts chapter 9, but Barnabas took, took hold of Paul and described to them how he had seen the Lord and how at Damascus he spoke out boldly in the name of of Jesus. A couple more. Barnabas and Paul having risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 16. This is where Paul uh, uh, speaks to the, the young girl who is um, uh, filled with an evil spirit. I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very moment. And then in Acts chapter 21, then Paul answered, what are you doing weeping and breaking my heart? For I'm, re- I'm ready not only to be bound, but even to die at Jerusalem. For what? I am ready to die for the name of the Lord Jesus. The understanding that we bear the name of Jesus in our lives is critical to us having a successful ministry, a successful personal life, and a successful life as a congregation in the last days. All right, kids quiz, uh, raise your hand. I'd be happy to call on you. I want your help. These are some uh, questions I think that are kind of fun. As the church grew in Acts, what was it named before they were called Christians? Were they called the way? This is before the Mandalorian, okay? So, were they called God-fearers? The sect of the Nazarenes? Or just simply the brethren? What do you think? Raise your hand. Kids are being kind of shy this morning. Is it Abel that wants to answer? Did did you what'd you say? B the God fears. Oh D the brethren. That's that's a good answer, Caleb. He says the sect of the Nazarene sounds so so secretive. One more. Anyone else want to guess? All right, we're going to let Emma have a chance. Emma, help us out here. She says, the way, the way. All right, this is one of those kind of tricky ones. It's all of them. All of them. They were called... (laughs) You know, we we don't always do it your way, Sarah. Sorry. (laughs) As a matter of fact, the Acts 9 verse, when Paul go, or, you know, Saul goes to persecute Christians in Damascus, he specifically, the Bible says, he was going to persecute the disciples of the way. 
the way. They, those who are proclaiming the way of the Lord. Jesus who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So they were called the way. They were called, God fears is, is, is a more generic term. It's a little bit of a cheat. That was for any Greek or Gentile believer who had accepted the Jewish God. They were called a God fearer. So, uh, there were many of those among the early church. They are called the sect or the sect of the Nazarenes in Acts 24. And again, the most general uh, moniker was they just referred to themselves as the brethren. Remember, the early church really did not consider themselves uh, different from the from Judaism. They just thought that they had taken Judaism to its logical direction now that the Messiah had come. So uh, it was not common for them to be referred to as Christians. So number two, what city were the followers of Christ first called Christians? Was it Jerusalem, Rome, Antioch, Chicago, or Prescott, Arizona? Serious stuff here. I actually saw your hand. Oh yeah, Andre. Jerusalem! That's a great get! Wrong. So, I'm sorry, Andre. I appreciate you being here. All right, I, I think I saw Anna's hand next, so I got to go to Anna. Yes, Anna, what would you say? What was it? Rome? Oh, that makes so much... Wrong. All right, I'm going to come back over to this side. I'm sorry, is that you, Hannah? All right, she said it loud and bold. It's Antioch. Antioch. <laughs> She's like... I, I'm sorry. I like to, I like to play. I appreciate everyone. If you didn't really know that, uh, those, those first two would have been a very good guesses. But the Bible actually mentions this. The disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. And they did not give themselves that name. That was the name the city gave them to mock them. Did you know that? Now, years later, centuries later, the church would say, oh, it was the bishop of Antioch, Eusebius. He was the one to call. They didn't like the idea that pagans had given them their name. But it's, it's relatively historically sound. Antioch was known for doing this. Uh, Rome used to kind of uh, uh, identify that Antioch loved to give these different mocking titles to the different religious groups that met with them. So that what they did is they took a Greek word, Christos, a follower of Christ in Greek would have been called Christos, and they put a Latin ending on it, Christiana, Christiana, and it was kind of their mocking way of saying, you guys aren't Greek, you're not Roman, you kind of you kind of let anyone, you've got Syrians in your church, you've got uh, Phoenicians in your church, you've got Greeks, you've got Jews, you're kind of all over the place, you're Christiana, you're not Greek, you're not Latin, you've just kind of shoved everything together. So that's kind of the origin of the word Christian. It was a, a pagan mocking of the early church. Um, and yet it has uh, become what we understand it. The word Christian only appears three times in all the Bible. Did you know that? Twice in Acts. But notice what Peter says about it here. This is one that becomes important. If anyone suffers as a Christian, this is later on in the church life, they embrace the title. They don't reject it. Yeah, we are a mixture of all people. We are Greeks and Romans and Jews. You want to call us that? We embrace it. We are followers of Christ in any language, in any culture. That's who we are. If anyone suffers as a Christian, he's not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in this name. In this name, identifying ourselves as followers of Jesus Christ, a mashing together of language and culture, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in this name. I think I have one more. Oh, yeah. Names are so fun. I love names. What names did these individuals have before or as they followed the Lord? Some name changes are because of conversion. Other, other names are just people had more than one name. So what else was Paul known as? Paul. Emmett. He was also known as Saul. Now, I just want to hit pause here for a second. Think of the type of family that would name their child Saul. Saul, he was of the tribe of Benjamin, so that makes sense. Uh, uh, Saul was of the tribe of Benjamin in the Old Testament. Uh, Paul or Saul in the New Testament is of the tribe of Benjamin. But Saul goes down in disgrace and dishonor in the Old Testament. Literally, it'd be like someone naming their kid Nixon today. And there probably are some Nixons out there. Or Enron. This is my son, Enron. 
You know, these names that engender disgrace and dishonor. Um, how many Adolfs are running around today? Not a lot of Adolfs. It's been kind of ruined. After the American Revolution, I doubt there are a lot of Benedicts. Right? No one wanted to name their son Benedict after that traitor, Benedict Arnold. And yet, think, now, this tells you something a little bit about the psychology of Paul when we first meet him. He is named after a rather tyrant of a king, and he's raised in the strictest of ways. It gives you an idea of why this guy struggled to understand grace, doesn't it? He was named Saul. Whew, amazing. Anyways, I'm going to start preaching if I don't stop here for a second. All right, oh, I'm sorry. Abel, I saw your hand up. Were you going to say Simon? No. Yeah, I knew you were. And so you and I were together on that one. And I just, I give it to you. So I'm sorry, I hit the button too fast. So we know that Peter was first known as Simon and Jesus gives him the name uh, Peter. And he's also called Cephas, which is also um, meaning stone in, in, in the Bible. All right, Israel, before I hit the button. Israel, all right, I, I, Toby, I know you've had your hand up for a second. So Toby, he is called Jacob. That's right. Um, and this is kind of a conversion story. After he wrestles with God and has that amazing experience, then God says, you shall be called Israel. All right, couple of ladies now. Sarah. Sarah had a different name. Addie. And that's right. It's not a big difference, even in its meaning. Sarai, whenever you have an I in Hebrew, it's the idea of my. It's the pronoun. So Sarah means my princess. And when God, God changed her name. So it's not like it was just a translation issue. God specifically tells Abraham, she is no longer to be known as Sarai, but Sarah, meaning the princess. Not, not, she's no longer your princess, Abraham. She's now the princess of the entire nation that would come from you. That's kind of the idea. That's the theory, at least. All right. And then we have this amazing person, Esther. All right. I think, is that Jonathan back there? Oh, I'm sorry. Behind you, Jonathan. Hadassah! Is Hadassah here, by the way? Is she here? Oh, I don't see her. All right. Sorry. Thank you very much. Yeah, very good. A lot of times it gets forgotten that Esther's Hebrew name was actually Hadassah. And it was probably Uncle Mordecai. It was very common when you're in a new culture to embrace a, a, a name that is consistent with that culture. Just like Daniel and, and, uh, 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 Shadrach, me. We know him as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but they actually had Hebrew names: Azariah, Michelle, and and uh, something else. I've forgotten it. Yeah, yeah, their names get changed. So probably Uncle Mordecai said, "Let's call you Esther because Hadassah doesn't really go in this Persian culture. Hadassah means myrtle tree. It's the the, the myrtle tree, uh, and Esther means star. Names, names are fascinating. Now I've been promising for a while that I. Oh, thank you guys for helping out in the in the kids quiz and. And just, uh, I love those little times of interactions. I've been promising for a while to kind of make some explanation of, of some of uh, the names in my family. I want to tell you a little bit about my family. My oldest daughter's name is Bailey. Bailey. She gets that name because it's Gina's maiden name. Gina grew up as Gina Bailey. And uh, when we had Bailey, it was kind of becoming in vogue to name kids after maiden names. And she'd been wanting to do this for a long time. So I really had no choice. It was kind of like one of those agreements that it just, if we had a girl, she would be named Bailey. So that's how Bailey gets her name. It's an old English word. It kind of is related to bailiff. And you had the uh, constables who guarded the streets and the Baileys who guarded the watchtower. So it really means like someone who guards and keeps watch. Timri, on the other hand, this one was <clears throat> different. I am named after my uncle. I have an uncle, David, and he has a daughter named Timmy, my cousin. I've always loved my cousin Timmy. I love all my cousins, but I always loved the name Timmy. And uh, since my uncle Dave had a Timmy and I now was having another daughter, I thought, I wonder if we could use Timmy, but I didn't want to use Timmy exactly. So I was just kind of playing around with Timmy, Timmy, and uh, t Tim Ree. Tim, what do you think about Tim Ree? And uh, of course, my wife had to agree with what I said, so we went with Tim Ree. And so it's kind of a similar uh, family name. And we've met similar Tim Rees in time, but that's Timri's name. Now, Tobiah, Toby's name, 
is actually Tobiah. And I was studying in college at the time. I was taking Hebrew. <laughs> and I loved the, and the uh, idea of the goodness of God and God, God is good. So Tobiah means God is good. And uh, we felt that God was very good to us in giving us a son. So we chose Tobiah um, for Toby. Now Gina's name, she has a grandma Jean. And so her parents wanted to kind of honor the grandparents. And so she got Gina spelled this way, G-E-N-A, um, but it's after her grandma, Jean. And then there's Dave. <laughs> this one, this was a little different. So let me give you the, the background of how my name came about. As I mentioned, I'm named, well, I've been feeling the pressure, believe me. The, the evil eye has been upon me and I'm now responding. As I mentioned, I'm named after my uncle. My, my mother has an older brother named David, and she named me after her brother, but he also after King David. Um, that was part of the family tradition. But um, at some point in my life, I began to prefer Dave. And even, even, even now, when I hear David, I hear my mom, and I hear my grandma. You know when they call you your full name? David, David Ryan. My middle name is Ryan. I hear, my, I hear that. And so from about age 8, 9, 10, I began to distance myself from that parental kind of identifier. I'll go by Dave. Dave is what I go by. And I put that on all my papers uh, in school, third, fourth grade. I'm Dave. All right? So that, that became my preferred nickname. Then at age 14, something happened. I have always, and I'm going to try to keep this brief, I have always loved the mystery and the mythology of the British Isles. Always. Uh, the Arthurian legends and the Grail and the Celts and the Volsacs, the Welsh, the Irish, all of that uh, storyline pre the Normans, even pre the Vikings in a lot of this. There's just so much culture and mystery and it's always appealed to me, Chuck. I just have always loved it. So when I was 14 years old um, and even the birth of Christianity in England is incredibly rich and, and uh, it, ha- it c- carries with it some of these great stories of Joseph of Arimathea and British Israelism and all these things. But anyways, um, we don't know when Christianity came to the British Isles. The first church comes around uh, the 7th century, um, 700 years, that's a long time. But we know Tertullian wrote in the 2nd century that Christianity had, um, had reached the Isle of the Britons. Christianity had reached the Isle of the Britons in the second century, is what Tertullian says. Um, so I was reading, because I've always loved reading um, about Gaelic history, um, I was reading about a Latin monk who went to the Volsacs, that's the Welsh, um, and the Welsh, by the way, are very different than the, Eng- than the English. <laughs> Don't ever call a Welshman an Englishman. <laughs> but um, a Latin monk was visiting the Volsacs, and he wanted to proclaim to them Jesus. And as he began to talk to them about Jesus, the Volsacs says, now wait a minute, we already worship Jesu, son of Maru, the son of Dave, spelled D-A-Y-V. The the way that David is spelled comes through the Germanic uh, route. If you go through the Latin and Gaelic route, the final D is softened and the internal V is shortened to a U or a Y. And so in the old Welsh language, and by the way, the patron saint of Wales is David. The patron saint of Wales is David, not not King David. They had a, a bishop that ruled in the 7th century or something like that, and they've embraced And so in Welsh, in the Welsh language, the name David today is pronounced Dawi. Dawi. Um, but in this story that I was reading when I was 14, the Latin monks, when they came to the... Um, to the Druids of the Volsac people, they already said, we're worshiping Jesu, the son of Maru, the son of Dave, spelled D-A-Y-V. So before the first recorded missionaries came to the British Isles, there were already a native people worshiping Jesus. I think that's pretty cool. By the way, there's stories like this all over the world, in Ethiopia and India and, and elsewhere. So, Mark, does that help you understand? Is it clear? So, so I chose to redesign the, uh, the spelling of my name and I began to write that on my paper. And I also, it was very practical for me because in my school at the time, there was like seven other Davids in, in, in school. 
and our papers would get confused. We would get uh, re- grades reported differently. So when I when I did the thing of, of being kind of silly and putting DAYV, it kind of helped people identify, oh, that's the Dave. That He's the one who did that and gets this and, and that. And so I've always just done that from... Yeah, the weird Dave. Yeah, yeah. That's that's uh that it goes it goes. Yeah, I'm sorry. Can we get no more comments? This is getting. It's uh got to stick to the thing here. You guys love you guys. This is fun. So that's that's kind of the history and the story of that. My mom gets blamed a lot. How did you come up with that name? I say it wasn't my mom. It's a regular name, David, but I preferred Dave and. And uh, I, because of that hobby and, and interest of mine, a discovery, I, uh, I embraced the kind of Welsh form of ancient Gaelic in the spelling of my name. So anyways, what is our name? What is our name? We are called Christian. Christian. There's other names that we could be called, you know, followers of the Lord and, and uh, believers in Jesus. But we have embraced and accepted the title Christian as our name. I want you to think about the third commandment for a second. Actually, think of the first three commands. Um, you shall have no other gods before me. That's the first commandment. Have no other gods before me. And in addition to that, don't make idols of anything that can take the place of the true God in your life. Don't have images. Don't have idols. And then do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished, who takes his name in vain. But just notice, the command talks about us taking his name. He does offer us his name. You can't take it in vain if you haven't taken it in the first place, right? He wants us to take his name, but he doesn't want us to take his name in vain. He says, if you're going to, if you're going to call yourself a Christian, you can take that name, but don't call yourself a Christian and live like the devil. Right? All of you who are grown up being taught that the third commandment was about swearing, that's really not what the commandment's about at all. That would be a violation of the ninth commandment. The third command is take my name, but live by what that name means. Don't take my name and then live in a way that does violence and injustice to everything that my name means. Take my name. I want you to have my name. There's power in my name. But respect that power and live with the Holy Spirit giving you wisdom in how to f- fully live out what that name means. So it is a hugely important, honorable thing to be go- to go by the name of Christ. To be able to say, Christ, His name covers me, is not to be taken lightly. Uh, a couple of uh, verses here in, in 2 Thessalonians. When He comes to be glorified in His saints... On that day, sorry, oh, it's a little cut off here. And to be marveled at among among uh, among all who believe, for our testimony to you was believed. To this end also we pray you always that our God will count you worthy of your calling and fulfill every desire for goodness and the work of faith with power. Notice this, so that, why does God want us to fulfill every desire of goodness and the work of faith with power? So that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ will be glorified where? In you. God wants us to fulfill wonderful, powerful, important, critical, miraculous things in the last days, but not for Dave Lounsbury's glory, not for any particular church's glory with a certain name, but for the glory of the name of Jesus Christ. That should be our motivating factor. Why do we do the works of faith? Why do we share the gospel? Why do we tell people that we have hope in the face of disaster? Why do we tell people that we have a Lord who is coming again to rescue us? It's not to draw attention to ourselves, but it's to draw attention to the name of Jesus Christ so that more can also embrace that name. We do that so that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ will be glorified in us You and Him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are baptized in His name. Now, I'll I'll come to that in a second. We are called by His name. We are saved by His name. We worship in His name. We trust in His name. We walk in His name. I want to come back to this verse here in Acts uh, for a second. Peter, uh, uh, performing the miracle to the man who was lame, he says, silver and gold I don't have, but what I give to you, in the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, walk. 
walk. Now, what Peter does not say to him here is you're going to walk now in the name of Jesus Christ, but tomorrow you don't need to worry about it. You can get up and the miracle's performed and the miracle's is done, but tomorrow, after the miracle's gone, you don't need to worry about that name anymore. You can just keep on walking. That is not what the verse says at all. If you want to walk, you must walk in the name of Jesus Christ now and forever. As a matter of fact, in the Greek, the, the verb for walk is called a present active imperative. A present active imperative. And what that means, the imperative is a command. Okay, I am giving you the authority. I am commanding you to walk. The active means it's something you're going to do. It's not going to be done to you. It's not passive. You're going to do this because you've been given the command. But the present tense of the verb means it's something that you're going to do now and you're going to do continually. It was just not, it was not just a momentary miracle in his life. If he wanted to continue walking, he had to walk in the name of Jesus Christ that day and every day after. Does that make sense? And the same is true for us when we receive the name of Jesus Christ, when we are baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That is not a momentary existence. That is not, thank you, Lord, for baptizing me, to giving me your name today. I might want to have that name tomorrow. Probably not the next day. I'll relook at that name maybe in a week. You take that name as an inherent part of your being. It becomes yours. You must embrace that name if you are to walk. If we are to walk in the way of the Lord, it can only be through the power of His name. His name as the Christ, the Messiah, as Christian. We are Christians first, foremost, and before all things. God says we are to love the Lord with all our heart, soul, mind, and body. We are to put Him first in our lives. We are Christians first, not Republicans or Democrats. We are Christians first, not liberals or conservatives. We are Christians first, not Americans or Arizonians. Arizonans? Arizonians? (laughs) We are Christians first, even above our occupation. More than being a doctor or a dentist, more than being a farmer, more than being a plumber, a teacher, a student, or a preacher. I am a Christian saved by the blood of Jesus Christ first and foremost in my life. We are Christians first, not black, white, Asian Pacific, Native American. We are Christians first. That is not to say these other things aren't important. We are Christians first, more than even being mom or dad. Wow, pastor, that's getting kind of extreme. Wait a minute. Ah, mom and dad's pretty high stuff there. Let me tell you something. Whenever I lose my patience with my kids, whenever I fail them, whenever I raise my voice or I break a promise and I reflect on it, I know it's because I had broken my first promise to Jesus Christ first. There's a reason why the first words of the Lord's Prayer are our Father. If I want to be a good father, I have to put Christ first in my life. Because if I put my own self first, it taints and it perverts everything else that comes after that. We must be Christ and Christian first in everything in our life. Because without that connection, without that commitment, everything else suffers. We are Christians first, and that informs every other part of our identity. That gives us context. That gives us boundaries. That gives us power when we are Christian first. I belong to Christ. I am crucified with Christ. Therefore, I no longer live, but Christ lives within me. And the life that I live is not my own, but it is the life of Him living through me. We put Christ on the back burner of our lives. If we make him second in any place, we are in violation of the third commandment of taking the Lord's name in vain. You shall have no other gods before me. Dave Lounsbury must come second. I am Christ's first. And that is who informs my identity, no matter how I spell the name as Dave Lounsbury. We must 
we must embrace the precious holy name of Jesus as our own. If anyone suffers as a Christian, don't be ashamed. Glorify God in this name as a Christian. Everything that we do, everything that we try to do must be completely bathed in the reality of our relationship with Christ as our primary identity. Nothing else works. Nothing else will satisfy. Who are you today? All the ways we can break ourselves into categories, racial categories, occupational categories, uh, relational categories, they have their purpose. It's not that those things are irrelevant, but they can only be properly understood and applied when we are first Christian. Christian. Now, some of you may be saying, oh yeah, pastor, you missed one. I'm a Christian first and then Seventh-day Adventist. But I've always kind of considered that a, a false dichotomy. I think that we can be passionate Seventh-day Adventist Christians and be consistent with being what a Christian is without the two being in conflict. But to each to work that out on their own. You know this passage, and I'm going to close here. If my people, who are called by what name? Not Dave Lounsbury's name. Not Peter's name. Not Israel's name. If my people, who are called by, by my name, humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from wickedness, from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. I believe that promise still applies today, guys. We want to see our land healed. If we want to see forgiveness reign supreme, if we want to be ready for the return of Jesus Christ, let's put him in his name first in our lives. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, thank you for being so eternally patient, kind, and compassionate. Thank you, Lord, for working out your perfect will within such a broken and imperfect person, such as me and every other human being that is willing to let your spirit in their life. God, I pray that as we navigate our lives, as we organize and orient ourselves to what you place in front of us, Lord, that we would make a deep commitment to make you first in our life, your name, the Messiah, the anointed one, Jesus, who has come to save his people from their sins, the Savior. Everything that your name means and implies also covers us, Lord. So help us, Father, There are so, so many directions that we can be pulled. There are so many emotions grabbing at us, so many things seeking to distract, to divide. But Lord, may we be united on this one front. We glorify you by accepting your name as the all-sufficient power for our lives. The name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We are Christians first. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, everyone, for coming. I hope that you have a wonderful rest of your Sabbath. We do have potluck next door, so if you are planning on that and wanting to come, we look forward to fellowshipping with you there. God bless.